Well, we are tracking the natural disaster in southern Colombia right now. Officials there say mudslides have killed at least 112 people. Many others are missing or injured. Heavy rain has triggered the slides, which washed away houses and bridges. Firefighters say electricity, water and hospital services have been knocked out in the disaster zone. Colombia's president is now on his way to the site. Well, CNN's Rafael Romo is here to take a closer look at what is going on with this tragedy. And Rafael, I just heard that the governor there is reporting that entire neighborhoods have been washed away. That's exactly right. And unfortunately, Linda, death toll keeps on rising. Uh, we first heard that it was uh, 12 people, then 60, then 80. And uh, President Juan Manuel Santos finally put the uh, number at 112. And there are many more people missing. So at this point is uh, preliminary to talk about a final death toll but you see the images and see what happened there are three rivers around the town of Mocoa this is in the province of Putumayo in southern Colombia the rivers overflowed last night and this is what happened you see the images of devastation there are many houses completely completely flattened and uh, many people who are still missing now Linda what happened according to President Juan Manuel Santos in a whole month in this area, they get 400 millimeters of rain. Last night alone, they got 130 millimeters, meaning 30% of the rain that they get in a whole month, they got it in a single night. And so the rivers around the community overflowed uh, and, and uh, we had a series of mudslides and, and, and flooding uh, that flattened many of these homes. And, and at this point, the president has just arrived in the area and the, the search and rescue crews are beginning their work. Yeah, we can just see those pictures of the military rescue underway. Police have also been deployed to help. It sounds like there was little warning before this hit. It sounds like it was one of those storms that there's there's no warning at all. It happened late at night, so people didn't really have time to get out of the way uh, to flee their homes, and, and that complicated the natural disaster even, even more. Uh, when you take a look at these aerial images, you get an idea of what might have happened. Uh, the water that you see in the middle of those houses came from the three rivers surrounding the community that I was talking about so there's really no way to escape especially if this happens late at night linda heavy rains in the southwest part of colombia have caused a massive landslide with mud and debris crashing into houses leading to widespread death and destruction hundreds of people are reported missing in the town of mocoa president juan manuel santos traveled to putumayo province to assess the extent of the damage we don't know how many more dead there will be. We are still looking. First of all, I want to say that my heart and the hearts of all Colombians are with the victims of this tragedy. Troops have been deployed as part of the emergency response. Officials say some towns have been cut off without electricity and water. We have declared with the governess a state of calamity so we can best attend the situation. We have a plan of action with the institutions that are here, and we are going to send humanitarian help and tend to all of the injured. The landslide followed heavy rains, which caused the Makua River to overflow. Rescuers say 17 neighborhoods have been affected, and one police official says the weather is still creating problems. The difficulties we are having are due to the fact that it hasn't stopped raining. The amount of mud produced by the avalanche was huge. 80% of the roads have been affected. According to the government's weather forecasters, March was Colombia's rainiest month in six years. The size and power of the mudslides, evident in the devastation they left behind. It's being described as a water avalanche, towers of water and mud formed as rivers burst their banks after days of heavy rainfall. The mudslides crashed into 17 neighbourhoods in the southern city of Mokoa at around midnight on Friday. Those in its path had little warning. We've lost a baby. He's gone missing. A little baby. We can't find him anywhere. I haven't heard from my relative. All I know is that her husband grabbed her by the hand, but he couldn't hold on, and the current swept her away. The lists tell a story of unimaginable loss. Eight years, 10 years, 14. These are the names of the missing children.
a father touches a name in his grief, the closest he can get when he has little idea of where his child may now be. My niece, she says. Like so many others here, she is desperate to search for the missing youngsters, but given the force of the mudslides, most simply don't know where to start. Makoa is now the centre of a major search and rescue operation, with at least 1,100 soldiers and police picking through the debris. It's the provincial capital of Putumayo and home to 40,000 people. The water avalanche knocked out power in half the province. President Juan Manuel Santos visited Mokoa and has declared a state of public calamity. Tons of aid and rescue equipment has been sent from the capital Bogota to the disaster zone and people are picking through the tons of debris trying to salvage whatever is still usable. Nadie me da razón, nadie, nadie. Nadie me da razón de mi casa. Nobody has any news, nobody. No news on my house or my family. I'm at the mercy of my God, I have nothing. Nothing to eat, nowhere to sleep. These clothes were given to me. The scale of the devastation and loss is for many here incomprehensible. They know the chances of survival are slim, but still cling to the hope that their loved ones may still be found alive. Miriam Nahond, Al Jazeera. Devastating and deadly, the remnants of a powerful cyclone have swept along Australia's east coast, inflicting flooding and destruction. Tens of thousands have been affected, with at least three lives lost in the floods and fears for other people still missing. It's unbelievable, mate. Look, the traffic lights, they're nearly under. Look at the signs over there. The houses, everyone's had to evacuate. The disaster zone from ex-cyclone Debbie stretches a thousand kilometers from Queensland state's tropical resort islands and Gold Coast tourist strip to the farmlands of New South Wales. Great amount of effort uh, has, been, has been focused the last 24 hours uh, on flood rescues, making sure uh, people are safe. We're now in a position where we're focusing on those uh, those that have been isolated, making sure they've got sufficient food and water. Uh, and then we expect by Monday that we'll be into the recovery mode. For now, with more than 100,000 homes without power and communities swamped and stranded, many are still waiting for this nightmare to end. Tens of thousands of Australians are stranded by floodwaters. Powerful cyclone Debbie swept along the country's east coast, cutting roads, destroying bridges and killing two people. The disaster zone stretches a thousand kilometres from Queensland State's tropical resort islands and Gold Coast tourist strip to the farm of New South Wales State. The disaster has left more than 100,000 homes powerless. Six large rivers have reached major flood levels and are still rising in several areas, said the Bureau of Meteorology. Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull urged people to be vigilant and not to take risks. Most of my stuff got still left there and it'll all be gone. Now the water went up to the top of the windows so everything even that I got up out of it would be gone. When I came down here a couple of hours ago this morning the, uh, the water down there was up to the roof line on the shed and there's a house behind the shed that we can't see, we can't even see the roof of the house. So. I don't know whether the house is still there or whether it's actually gone this time. At least one Indonesian farmer has been killed and dozens of others are still missing after a rain-triggered landslide tore through a village in Indonesia's East Java province. A spokesperson for the country's disaster mitigation agency said dozens of people were buried by the landslide. 
Emergency rescue crews are at the disaster site working to assist victims and find those still unaccounted for. In Pedregal, Chico, Peru, dry land is hard to find. The rain has not fallen in several days, but the Piura River is still overflowing, and residents are struggling to cope. I am carrying him to where it is dry because he was drowning and I am rescuing him, taking him to safety so that he doesn't drown. The El Nino weather phenomenon has unleashed torrential downpours in recent weeks, affecting nearly 900,000 people across Peru and killing at least 98. A state of emergency is underway here, and 25 tons of humanitarian aid have been delivered, but residents say it's not enough. Volunteers are doing what they can, but they say without more government help, recovery is likely a long way off. Welcome back. Heat waves have hit northern parts of India and also the western parts of the country. Several states are reeling with sweltering heat conditions. Some cities, in fact, recording temperatures above normal. During this time of the year, we are still in March and we can feel the heat according to the Met Department. The temperatures, in fact, have shot up six degrees above the normal mark. The Met Department has predicted heat wave will only intensify in the month of April. Warnings have already been issued in Gujarat, Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, in southern parts of Uttar Pradesh and in Haryana. As well. Hi, I'm Kartiki and you're watching SkyMet for the report. India continues to be under the tight grip of heat wave conditions. In fact, hot weather conditions have further reached to Odisha, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand and other parts of West Bengal. Temperatures across the region, especially Vidarbha region, are also settling above 43 degree mark. Moreover, we do not predict any relief in the next few days. However, Gujarat has managed to steal some relief with a marginal drop of a degree or two, but weather will continue to be hot over the region. In fact, northern plains such as Delhi and Sir Haryana also continued with significantly above normal temperatures. Similarly, Telangana, Rail Sima and North India Karnataka will also record day maximum above 40 degree mark. California is not short of coastline, and therein lies a problem. Because waves lapping at the shore might sound romantic now in 2017. Give it a few decades, it could be disastrous further inland. After years of drought, the heavy rain came to California this winter. And with ocean levels rising, experts are worried about what happens next. It will affect everyone. They've been monitoring the sea levels here for years, and here's what the science says. The sea level is rising, and it's rising faster than ever before in modern history. The prognosis is not good. Right now, we have problems of flooding from storm surges, from El Ninos, from high tides, waves superimposed upon high tides, and of course, events like Sandy and Katrina. And, and the, the frequency of those events, the intensity of those events, will increase with climate change, and they will be superimposed upon a higher stand of sea level. So they have more destructive power. That is the Pacific coast, and look at that. What an amazing view. If you live up here on higher ground, you're gonna be paying an absolute fortune for that view, but you're also gonna be much safer. If you live on lower ground, then time is very slowly running out. In fact, experts say by the end of this century, some 13 million people living along US coastlines will be forced to move to higher ground. And we're not just talking about homes here, that would be bad enough. We're also talking about all of those things that keep a city ticking along. Refineries bringing gas to US cars, huge airports built near the coast, relocating, ocean proofing, building major infrastructure, all of it costly. Long term, this is, this is going to be billions of dollars. That's the assessment of this expert who raises another critical issue. 
We also get a lot of our groundwater from coastal aquifers. And with sea level rise, we're going to have more seawater intrusion. And so we could lose more of our local water supplies if we don't put in um, injection barriers to ensure that seawater doesn't get into and contaminate our groundwater basins. And so that's, that's a very, very big concern. A study at the end of the last decade put $100 billion worth of property at risk, much of it near San Francisco Bay. Add to the mix any damage from a major earthquake or a potential tsunami, and the worry is real. The melting Arctic glaciers may be a long way from here, but the tide is turning around the world, and it is coming ever closer. Phil Lavelle, CGTN, Los Angeles. Two out of every three Africans lives without electricity. Efficient, affordable is now within reach. Essentially not by following the path of the Western world where we built power plants and strung people up and then they bought electricity from a utility. That's not working. It has not worked in Africa and much of Asia. And what's happening instead is a revolution that is decentralized power enabled because of solar energy doesn't have to be centralized. It can exist at the point where you need it. This Maasai herdsman charges his mobile phone using the solar panels on his roof, paid for using that same phone. It's changed my life. It's, it's great. I've got electricity. I can watch the television to get the country's news. My children can study and, and write at night. And it's because I've got this electricity. Most Africans have never installed landline telephones. Going straight to mobile is known as leapfrogging providing the additional benefit of access to financial services. Customers, they pay through installments. It's like a prepaid phone. So whenever you uh, use the system for a certain period of time, you have to pay through mobile money. And then when you have paid, you receive a code which you have to, to enter here. Conventional big grid electricity can work effectively in dense urban areas but is highly inefficient and costly across the plains, deserts, rainforests and mountainsides of Africa. They will use solar energy not only for uh, lighting, not only for television and phone charging, but they will also use it for electromobility in the future. They will use it for refrigeration and um, uh, charging laptops and all the other devices. A similar all-in-one system is also being rolled out in rural and urban areas of Uganda to provide consumer services and new business opportunities for customers. Smartphones, Wi-Fi routers, tablets, and income-generating technologies such as hair clippers, water pumps, and phone charging banks uh, all require power, and, and we're solving that first problem. Phoenix International has doubled its customer base in Uganda in just one year to 100,000. The company is also constructing a new model so those customers can access a broad range of financial services. So for each customer, we create a credit score. And 70% of our customers are unbanked, so this is the first time they're able to generate a credit score. And with this credit score, we can then extend them access to credit for the other life-changing technologies and services that they need. A key goal of organizations like the International Finance Corporation here in Washington is to rid the world of dirty, costly, and frankly dangerous lighting sources like this homemade kerosene lamp. So the promotion of solar-powered LEDs like this makes a lot of sense. Leapfrogging in the economic development process enabled by disruptive technologies, disruptive business models, means that the upward slope in economic development and the improvement of people's lives has been profound. These off-grid technologies are becoming so efficient, practical and affordable that they're lighting up new development opportunities right across this vast African continent. Daniel Wrenches, CGTN, Washington.